Good morning. We're going to have a conversation about persecution in the church. I think if you're like me, perhaps that persecution, while we've been aware of it somewhat, it hasn't been in our face like it has the last couple of years because now we see it on cable news day by day, right? Of course, persecution for believers began at the very beginning of the church, right after Pentecost. Believers began to be criticized by their culture and the political powers and the philosophical camps. When we get to Acts 8, we read the story of the first martyr, Stephen, as the Jews sought to purge Judaism of what they saw as a dangerous sect. And then we know that a short time after that, uh, Nero blamed the fire in Rome on Christians and persecution really began in earnest. Of course, persecution is actually not just a man's thing, of course. In fact, did you know that the first female Christian author was a woman named Perpetua who lived in the third century, a woman, get this, 22 years old, she's nursing a baby and she's put in prison and sentenced to die because she will not renounce Christ. Her father comes to the prison, begs her to come home to nurse her child and raise her child and she will not. And she's there in prison with uh, Perpetua is kind of a higher class person. She's in prison with a slave woman named Felicitas, and they prepared to face death together. And we read this about what happened when that day come. It says, at the demand of the crowd, they were first scourged before a line of gladiators, then a boar, then a bear, and a leopard were set on the men and a wild cow on the women. And wounded by the wild animals, they gave each other the kiss of peace and then were, were then put to the sword. So throughout history, and on this, even to this day, Christians are persecuted throughout the world. And so we've been in the book of 1 Peter, and Peter's admonition to us is rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And those words of 1 Peter have emboldened men and women to face persecution over many centuries now, entrusting their souls to a faithful creator. So I'm so grateful to be joined by this panel of people who bring a variety of perspective and experience and wisdom to this conversation about persecution. You may not know about D.A. Carson that he grew up in French-speaking Canada, which was thoroughly Catholic at the time. If you've read his wonderful little book, Memoirs of an Ordinary Pastor, he writes about his dad, who was a pioneering church pastor and church planter in Quebec, beginning at a time when Baptist pastors were persecuted and in prison. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Carson knows something of persecution from his own family history, but of course, Dr. Par Dr. Carson goes around the world all the time. In fact, I'd kind of like to see your frequent flyer statements, Dr. <laughs> Carson, because uh, this guy gets around. And so we look forward to how you, your, both your uh, love for God's word and love for Christ and your experience is going to add to this discussion. Thank you. Uh, Karen Ellis is currently a Ph.D. candidate in church history at Oxford, at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. In fact, you're heading to Oxford after you leave here, aren't you, to get going on your uh, doctoral dissertation. And Karen writes and speaks on human rights, religious freedom, and the persecuted church. She's currently an ambassador for the organization International Christian Response, and that's a group that provides spiritual and material assistance for persons who are persecuted as a result of their Christian beliefs around the world. Uh, Karen has a fabulous blog. If I just started following her on Twitter a, a few months ago. If you want to begin to be more aware of what's going on in the world in terms of persecuted people, 
uh, well then follow her tweets, go to her blog. She wrote recently on her blog, she said, for the genuine Christian, the most significant number in approaching persecution is one. So we'll find out in a little bit what you mean by that. Then we have Mindy Bells, and Mindy is the senior editor of World Magazine and the author of They Say We Are Infidels. Have some of you read this book? Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, I started reading this book this summer. It's an amazing uh, account um, of Mindy's personal right there experience, especially in the Middle East among Christians. Let me just read you a paragraph from this. She said... I tried to fathom the depths of Christian solidarity, watching these believers find water in this desert. The Christians took both earthly and unearthly provisions into the hardest and saddest and sometimes insanely dangerous places. Caring for displaced families when they first arrived was one thing, but it was another to help them for six months, one year, or 18 months later. The long years of war and persecution preceding the invasion of ISIS, had trained some muscle reflex. Only instead of it moving their hands away from the fiery flame, it moved them toward it and toward one another. Mm. So we're so grateful you're here, Mindy. I do have to tell you that the, about reading the book, it made my life seem so small and boring <laughs> with the way uh, the experiences that you have had. And then we have Nasteran Farahani. Nasteran grew up in Iran. She lives here in the States now in the Bay Area. And rather than me telling you about her, I'm going to let her tell us about her. So, and uh, English is not Nasteran's first language, so she's going to use some notes, but we're okay with that, aren't we? Yeah. So Nasteran... You grew up in a Muslim family, but something happened when you were 16, were 16 or 17 that changed everything about your life. Tell us what happened. Uh, one day while I was taking a shower, I heard someone was uh, talking to me, telling me, repent. The voice told me, I will wash, uh, I will, uh, I, I'm going to wash you off your sin. At that time, I didn't know what that voice is, was, and... Um, what was the meaning of those words. Um, but after a while, my sister, she came to Iran from Holland uh, for visiting. Uh, I realized that she has a Bible for me. So um, one, uh, one lady, she came to uh, her and she told her that um, she, God gave her, had a vis gave her a vision that um, she saw uh, three women sitting on the bed and all trust in Christ. So, and she told her, you have to go to Iran and visit them. And another uh, a woman came to her and, and gave her a ticket. So she came to Iran for a visit. Mm -hmm. And when she got home uh, to our family, she opened her bag and brought out the Bible and said, I believe in Jesus. And all my family started to cry. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I told her, I believe in Jesus. I know Jesus. I do not know how, uh, but I know him. I do not have any question. <laughs> so how did, <laughs> isn't that something? <laughs> So how did the rest of your family respond? You said they cried. Uh, how did they respond to this word of Jesus? Uh, they, just, they just cried. Within one month, my uh, mom converted. Uh -huh. And within two months, uh, my father uh, had a dream, vision, dream, yeah, and he converted uh, uh, to Christ. And we, uh, we started to go to the church. Um, that, on that time, the um, building church was open in Iran. But uh, while uh, after persecution coming to the church, we decided to gather at home and start the house church. But then things did change for the church in Iran after you began. And it was first open. You were in these house churches. And things really changed specifically for you so that you moved to Dubai for a while. But then you returned to Iran, and when you were going back into the country, you and your husband were arrested 
entering the country. So why were you arrested and what happened? Uh, when we arrived, the officer checked our passport and then called my name. He uh, took my um, he took my bag and started to searching. And then um, he uh, paid someone else and told him to take uh, my pa uh, husband's passport too. Uh, they took us to the separate room with no window, and uh, they started to integrate uh, us. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of my uh, close friends had been arrested in the past. Uh, one was held in jail for nine months. Uh, they were uh, constantly tell her, telling, them, uh, telling her that would be executed her. So it was really scary for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So when they were interrogating you, what kind of information were they trying to get out of you? Um, they want the name of people meeting in the cell group. Names uh, of people that were in your cell group cell when group. you were in Iran in your Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. They were looking for uh, members uh, who might uh, have been connected to the people outside of Iran. Um, they asked me, what is your plan? Thinking that we, we, we want to work uh, against the Iranian governments. Okay. And so were you then in prison? Were you held in jail? Uh, no, they uh, let me go, uh, but they uh, uh, kept my passport so I could not go anywhere. And they called me in two or three times for uh, integration. However, they kept my husband uh, for integration for three months, and they would question him more often. So what was that experience like for you, being interrogated and having your husband help? Uh, when I was in integrated, the word of Jesus in Matthew 10, 19 came to me. Uh, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. I was so scared and um, when I'm afraid, I cannot talk. <laughs> but I was given uh, what to say, uh, as, uh, just as a Jesus promised. Mm. Uh, I told them many things that never uh, would have come up to me uh, on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, they kept telling me that I'm a liar. Um, he tested me and wanted if my hands um, are, were shaking. Yeah. yeah. He offered me uh, tea, but I didn't drink because I heard many stories about how they, gave, um, they would give the woman uh, something to drink that make them fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And um, also I heard plenty of story of them raping women in the jail. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was so scared of that. Mm -hmm. So during those three months, while you're waiting to uh, be free to go and your husband is like, I think a lot of us fear that if something happened like that, we wonder how we would be able to endure that and what that would do to our faith and confidence in God. What was that like for you? Um, I just read the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, it was encouraging to me read what the Bible said about, uh, says about persecution and uh, suffering as a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, reading the experience of apostles and their terrible suffering and how they uh, had endured the suffering by putting their faith in their Lord Jesus was so, uh, it, it was make me uh, strong. Uh, I read, he will not test you more than you are able to bear, and be, I believed it. You believed it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I read the instruction to trust in God with, uh, with the promise that he will help you, and I experienced that. Exactly, mm. experienced that. Mm -hmm. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> so finally, they gave you your passports, and they told you to leave the country and don't come back. And saying that the next time they'll keep you in jail. And so you went back to Dubai, and then in 2011, you came to the States. Yeah, exactly. And we're so glad to get to know you, to have you as our sister in Christ. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So, Mindy, you've met and spent a lot of time with women living under significant persecution, especially in C Syria and Iraq, where Christians have been fleeing from ISIS. We, we know there's significant persecution, but sometimes it doesn't seem real to us because we don't have a face right. and a name right. 
and a real story. We haven't seen with our own eyes what their living conditions are like and sat down and talked with them. So you have met so many. Can you tell us a little bit about perhaps a particular woman who's living, been living under persecution? What's her daily life like? What are the fears that she faces? And how does the gospel make a difference in that situation? Well, there are so many unsung heroes and heroines in this situation since ISIS invaded Iraq in 2014. And, um, you know, if you remember from the headlines, they came in in two waves. They first came into the city of Mosul in Iraq and, and chased out all of the Christians, very specifically about 30,000 of them from that city of 2 million or so. Um, then they fanned out from there across Nineveh Plain. This is the ancient heartland of Christianity in the east, dating back to the third century. And um, the Christians had taken refuge in Nineveh Plain, in, in the ancient villages and in this town called Karakosh, which was the largest Christian city in that region. And no one ever expected that ISIS would be able to penetrate Karakosh. It was heavily guarded by Kurdish forces. But one day in August, two years ago, uh, the Kurdish forces fell back and said they couldn't, that ISIS was lobbing mortars and a bomb exploded in the center of town. It killed a boy, it killed a girl, a young woman who was supposed to be married that day. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the people that I think of in that situation, among many, are, are the, the 30 nuns, the Dominican sisters, uh, who had already fled Mosul, already were homeless, but they had, they had reestablished themselves at a convent in Karakosh. Sister Diana Momika is a woman in her 30s um, and, and very energetic, very beautiful, uh, very much at the heart of caring for other people, even though she herself was displaced. They were, these 30 sisters were taking care of 510 families. Wow. At, the, at that moment that ISIS invaded their city. When you city. say taking care of, what do you mean? They were sheltering them in the convent and in houses nearby. They were providing food for them on a weekly basis wow. and, and helping them because they didn't have any other resources. Um, so at the time that ISIS entered, I mean, it, w it was a mass exodus, and it was done at gunpoint. And even the elderly were being chased. I interviewed elderly people who were forced to flee 10 miles. They were ordered to go to a river and cross the river. These were people in their 70s, very frail. I interviewed one man whose leg had broken and was not reset for, like, months. Um, and, and what Sister Diana Momika did, she saw this happening. They didn't leave. That's a really important detail. Everybody else was fleeing and the sisters were staying to make sure everyone was taken care of. Sister Diana rounded up wheelbarrows and had young men to take them to, uh, to round up the elderly and they literally put the elderly in wheelbarrows and carried them to this river and all the time there's gunfire, there's explosions, there's fighting. Um, so a number of people were killed, but it's striking that most of the Christians escaped mm -hmm. Karakosh. They fled north, they entered what we call Iraqi Kurdistan, and that's where they are now. And Sister Diana and, and the 30 others, I mean, they, and other people were doing this. They were cramming like 20 and 30 people into a sedan, a four passenger sedan wow. and, and taking them north. Christians and others came down from the north and met them and, mm. and helped them to safety. And so once again, they had to find housing and, and shelter in, in the north. And while, the, again, these, these nuns themselves displaced, I mean, I think they're just a wonderful picture of, of believing the gospel enough to hope that God would provide for them. And then... Um, and then stepping immediately out into service, not even knowing what that provision was going to look like. And so even as they themselves are waking up in the morning not knowing, I mean, they were sleeping on church pews, mm -hmm. not knowing where their next meal was coming from. They were trying to provide for hundreds of families. Um, Sister Diana was 
was able to, she was very vocal about what was happening and she was speaking to news media and she was um, uh, telling her story to visiting delegations. Several American congressmen heard her story. They invited her to come and testify to Congress about what was going on even in the middle of it. The State Department denied her a visa to travel to the United States and that went on. I mean, they're literally just about had to be an act of Congress in order to grant her a visa for her to come and travel, but she did, and her testimony was very powerful because I think she spoke for all the Christians in saying, um, you know, what have we done wrong? Why should we not be allowed to return to our homeland? So, um, yeah. Karen, would you answer that same question? Would you tell us about one or two women you've known and looked into their eyes and prayed with and cared for who live daily under persecution? Yeah, women are especially vulnerable, I think, in these situations and, and suffer a number of things from psychological disorders to PTSD to divided families, missing parents, missing children, um, unplanned pregnancies. I mean, rape is a weapon of war. Um, it's, it's, it's a distortion of what God originally intended sex to be, and it's, a, it's the weaponization of it wreaks havoc on women in these situations. Um, thousands of women and young girls have actually been kidnapped um, and abducted by Boko Haram in Nigeria. I think we probably remember the, the Nigerian girls best from the Chibok village, uh, the 200-plus uh, girls. I think their situation sort of underscores the vulnerability of young women who suffer at the hands of their oppressors. Uh, 57 or so of the Chibok girls have bravely escaped. <laughs> How many uh, did you say? 57 or wow. so. Yeah. Um, none have been rescued by the government as, as yet. Uh, but uh, they've given us a window into the horror that they shared under those conditions. Uh, among this group was a five-year-old girl whose pelvis was shattered so much that she walks like an animal now. Mm. And we look at these things, at these injustices, and we think, this just, this shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to leave you with that image, though. Um, on the other side, there are, there's a house church movement that's exploding in Egypt. And on the, the amazing side of this, how God is using women in the midst of persecution, the movers and the shakers of this house church movement are the least of those in their culture. Uh, it's the, not only are they women, they're elderly women and they're illiterate. Mm -hmm. And they are, this, this explosion is happening through their discipleship. They're, these are hundreds of thousands of Eunices raising up Timothys mm -hmm. and impacting this culture. So uh, when I look at the span of uh, the joys and the sorrows and all the ranges in between. I see, I see women like Priscilla's uh, working alongside Aquila's. I see Eunice's. I see, Tim, I see uh, Lydia's wisely running businesses that impact the kingdom. Uh, and all this under very, very difficult circumstances. For me, these women, they're so brave in how they carry on the legacy of women in the New Testament church. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. So as Karen said, Dr. Carson, we look at this and we think this should not be that those who are called by the name of Christ, that, you know, we wonder how could God allow those whom he loves, those who are called by his name to suffer in this way, yet we also know that Jesus told us to expect persecution and said that we would be rewarded for it. So could you help us to understand where ultimately does persecution come from and help us know how to think about it? It would be a huge mistake to think that uh, persecution is an intrinsic good. Um, it is always a mark of the fall mm -hmm. of hatred toward God, mm -hmm. hatred toward other human beings, beings made in the image of God. Um, but there is a danger that Christians then start to think, this is where the devil's winning one, and God is taking a walk, or maybe snoozing. 
Um, what you have to see in the Bible, it's, it's one massive tension that is always there that you have to get hold of. And then a lot of other things fit into place. That is, nothing, absolutely nothing escapes the sovereignty of God. Absolutely nothing. So, so that when Joseph is sold into slavery and reflects on it later, he can say to his brothers, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. In one and the same event, not as if God came in after the fact and sort of cleaned up the mess, um, but, but in the one event, uh, God is operating with perfect goodness and, and the brothers were operating with malice. The evil is traceable back to the brothers but that doesn't mean that God was asleep at the switch. And you have to even think about the cross that way. And then it comes back to Christians. I mean, Herod and Pontius Pilate, the leaders of the Jews, entered into a two-bit conspiracy at a, in a small country in the eastern end of the Mediterranean to, to, put, together, to put to death this troublemaker, this, this man called Jesus, whom they saw as a political risk. But at the same time, they did what God had ordained beforehand should be done, Acts 4, 27 and 28. And um, if, if you don't see that God's hand was in the death of Jesus, then ultimately the cross is merely a blip in history. One more crucified man, that's it. Rather than God's plan from before the foundation of the world, uh, f foreseen already in the, the Lamb who, who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities in Isaiah 53, or in, in the Passover Lamb who whose blood is daubed on our doorpost so that the angel of death passes over and so forth. It, it, it's, it's just an accident in history. You have to see that God is operating with perfect righteousness and truth and goodness and sovereignty all the way down to the last bouncing quark. There are no accidents. Yet at the same time, you have to still say, this is outrageous. This is evil. B because God stands behind good and evil in different ways. He, he stands behind good and evil asymmetrically. That is, he stands behind good in such a way that the good is always traceable to him. He stands behind evil in such a way that the evil element in it all is finally traceable to secondary causalities. If the Bible insists on anything, it's that God is good. He's as good as he is sovereign. He's as sovereign as he is good. And so you have to hang on to the goodness of God. You let the tension perk. It runs right through Scripture. And then even in the midst of suffering, you can still say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Mm -hmm. and, and that confidence in God's sovereignty so that it's not a mistake, yet in God's purity and righteousness so that y you see his goodness is in no way compromised. And in any case, we're taking a long view of, of things we're, we're looking at not only this world, but the world it is to come, and we see that if Christ suffered this way, then in some way it can be an excellent thing, a good thing for us to join with Christ and be aligned with his sufferings. In some way it becomes a privilege, uh, even when it's miserable and hateful and full of tears and death. It, it, it rises to the level of privilege again, uh, filling up the afflictions of Christ for his church. So when you interact with people around the world, I imagine you have interacted with people who are living under persecution. Many. When you have a conversation with them, um, how does this matter of God's sovereignty over this and this sense of privilege? If, what would you, how would you encourage the persecuted person? I mean, I don't imagine you say, well, you know, God's sovereign over it, and so... <laughs> No, sometimes you just have, have to hold their hands and weep. And, um, and it's very important to listen. They have more experience on these sorts of fronts than I'll ever have. So, so it is important to be careful what you say. That's true. On the other hand, my experience has been that if, if Christians have had even a modicum of biblical training in this area, they gravitate in the right direction almost intuitively. Um, when the Muslim Brotherhood took power in Egypt a few years ago, and um, th there were Christians who were dying because of it. Mm -hmm. um, we have quite a number of graduates from the seminary where I teach that are Egyptians and, and living and working in Egypt and so on. And I emailed a few of them, you know, we're praying for you and so on. And uh, without exception, they emailed back saying, um, we're having the time of our lives. We're seeing more people turning to Christ than we've ever seen. Uh, it's almost as if the very violence of 
some sectors, it's not the whole Muslim world, but some sectors of the Muslim world has made some Muslims start asking questions and saying, there's got to be a better way and start thinking of the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. So, so there have been, there's been more boldness in Christian wow. witness in Egypt in the last uh, five years, seven years, than in the previous 50. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and perhaps more converts as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, you, you don't want to so focus on, uh, on the blood and gore, which is awful. Uh, you, you, you've got to see that, that, that God takes the prognostications of the pundits and turns them all on their heads mm -hmm. and brings a blessing out of, mm -hmm. out of uh, tears and, and, and sorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Karen, you really do keep your finger on the pulse of persecution around the world as well as you've been a student of the history of persecuted peoples. So would you talk to us a little bit about the course that increasing persecution takes in a particular culture or environment? Yeah, um, so there's a, a document that if you're not familiar with it, everybody should get familiar with it. It's called the International Declaration of Human Rights. And you can Google it, and it's the inter international standard by which most countries in uh, the world play by. And it assures you things like freedom of assembly, of religion, freedom to change your, uh, change your religion, uh, freedom, to, uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge list. Now, not everybody plays by those rules. There are other declarations by which uh, other ones, and that's sort of where a lot of the tension comes in, that not everybody's playing by the same document. But this is the document that the UN has decided these are the standards by which human flourishing can occur. And they're actually very, the principles are very biblical. They're based, even though it's a secular document. So you, should, you need to be familiar with that. Because that's what we use in the international community to determine if someone is entering into persecution. The question of how persecution begins to manifest is harder to answer. We here in the West, you know, and especially, I mean, I'm, I'm PCA, I'm Presbyterian. We like to check our little boxes. And, you know, it's like, oh, we're in this category, and this is where we are on the spectrum. But persecution doesn't always manifest in a linear fashion. There are things that come into play like it's generally historically, culturally, politically determined. And so because all of those things and all those dynamics change from region to region, the way persecution manifests looks different from India. India looks totally different from Pakistan. Pakistan's persecution looks totally different from North Korea because all of these different, uh, these different components are coming into play. So the rise of anti-Christian hostility for me is like, it's like soup. It's like making soup. You can, you can go to your kitchen and say, oh, I've got a carrot, I've got an onion, I've got some celery. You can put into the soup a number of different things that will make soup, but they may not always be the same thing. So if you've got the right combination of history, culture, politics, add in a little ideology, leaders, um, sometimes gender and ethnicity, any combination of these, you can get something that most people will recognize in the international community as persecution. I think uh, one good brother, uh, Egyptian friend of mine, uh, summed it up by saying, for him, he says, when you lose the ability in your culture to call sin, sin, you're under persecution. Karen, I mentioned earlier that you wrote on your blog, for the genuine Christian, the most significant number in approaching persecution is one. So what do you mean by that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so the media likes to give us um, disaster by numbers. You hey, know. wait a minute. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> No offense. <laughs> Some of the media. Some of the media. Okay, yeah. Others give us narratives and stories which yeah. carry the truth. <laughs> I got your okay. back, girl. Carry on. <laughs> Carry on. Go with your one. Thank you. But generally, the mainstream media likes to give us disaster by numbers. You know, people always want to know how many deaths, how many injured, um, and, mm. you know, the, the numbers... The larger the numbers, oftentimes, the, the greater the outrage in some ways. 
Um, there's only one number that really matters, though, to us as Christians. And I say that that number is one because for us, one isn't a statistic. Hmm. It's not a number. For us as Christians, one is a state of being. It's something that Jesus determined that we should be. We are one in him. And so through union with him, he prays for us in John 17, make them one as we are one. And this is a very particular kind of relationship that we have that compares to no other on earth. There are no other temporal relationships, either in relation to uh, God the Father, either on earth or in relation to God the Father, that are based on our spiritual union with the person of Christ. There's a reason why he calls us his body. And so our union together, it doesn't cancel out our earthly associations. We still have familial relations that are important, social relationships that are important, our tribal, our family and blood relations. But when we look at our connection through union with Christ, there's simply no other comparison to earthly alliances. So Paul, who's always writing from a context of persecution, he qualifies the primacy of our unique relationship in union with Christ by saying, do good to all, but especially those in the household of faith. So this is why I say that one is the only number that's necessary to stir us into action. Look at social media. You touch one Muslim and the world hears about it. You touch one member of the LGBTQ community and the world hears about it. How many of us remember the massacre of 148 Christian university students in Garissa, mm -hmm. Kenya? Terrible massacre. How many of us remember just a few months ago the man who went to a community college in Oregon and singled out nine Christians for their faith and shot them? Or have we forgotten about that already? For me, advocating for the persevering church is not activism, it's family business. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And our silence, honestly, our silence is to our shame. We can't rely on the media to tell our stories accurately, except for Mindy. <laughs> <laughs> But we can't rely on them to tell the mainstream media to tell our stories. We have to do what she's doing and tell our stories to each other, and we have to share them. I see people doing it for communities outside of the body of Christ. Don't tell me we don't know how to make hashtags trend <laughs> or organize memorials, memorial services to honor those around the world that we are connected to by one. We know how to do this. If you can't say amen, say ouch. Come on, y'all. <laughs> we are one. This is our body, and we are one in Christ. And that's the only number we need to move mm. and to help each other. Yeah. Thanks for those words, Karen. Mm -hmm. Challenge. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So, Mindy, if you were able to bring some of the women that you have interacted with in very harsh places, and we wish you could. Mm -hmm. if you, but if you were to bring them with you here in a setting like this, what would, what do you think they would want to say to us as Western Christians? What could we learn from them? Well, I do think the example of their lives is what we would want to learn from them. You know, when people ask me, how can I pray for the persecuted church? I, I, I typically think, well, we pray for the persecuted church the way it prays for itself. I mean, we learn from them uh, how they, uh, how we can advocate for them. And, and I think of one of the people in, that I write a lot about in the book is, Insaf Safu, who is a, a wonderful Iraqi woman who herself was a refugee and now has a ministry of working with these women that you've been talking about, these traumatized uh, women who've been living under some form of persecution now for years, I mean, even before ISIS. And, and you know, when you ask Insaf about all these 
issues that we've been talking about and what to do, she says, I only hear Jesus saying, feed my sheep. And I think that there's a lot that we in the West can take from that, that there is, there is physical and spiritual nourishment that people need. And, and women especially, Karen has spoken so well to the particular traumas of women undergoing persecution. And um, they need their dignity restored. Mm -hmm. they, they, need, um, they need to know that they still are human beings. Mm -hmm. They have in many cases been treated like animals, worse. Uh, treatment that we would not allow in this country of animals. And, um, and so restoring them and finding ways to do that that are, are both internal and supplying for the external needs. Um, so I think that that would be what they would bring because I don't think in this country, even now as much as we've heard about the subject, that we appreciate the depth, the daily depth, of the trauma and the challenges. Um, there, there is an amazing doctor who is working with both Christian and Yazidi women who have been rescued from ISIS. And he described for me one day by phone the, um, the unit that they have at one of the hospitals. They have them at a number of them, but this was the first one they set up. And it is a suicide watch unit mm -hmm. for young girls. Some of them are as young as 10. Mm -hmm. and, and these are, and I've interviewed a woman who's 18 who's tried to commit suicide twice. She wasn't even captured by ISIS, but she saw her friends disappear. And she saw her life disappear mm -hmm. before her. She pulled out her phone and she, she held it up and she showed me a picture of her at age three on her phone. And she said, it's the only piece of my childhood that's left. Mm -hmm. I downloaded it from Facebook. And so this is, a, this is the kind of devastation, the mental and spiritual and physical devastation. And, and I think that they would want women especially to understand all those aspects of it and to and Christian women then to come alongside them because I think only the gospel is sufficient to provide the to motivate us to care for the physical needs and to share the gospel in a way that begins to heal mm -hmm. on the inside. Master and I want to ask you something similar. Sometimes I wonder how Christians under persecution in other parts of the world feel about brothers and sisters who live in places where it's relatively easy to be a Christian. Do Christians in a place like Iran, do they feel abandoned by uh, Western uh, believers? Um, well, we know it's not easy for those in uh, other parts of the world to understand what life is like in Iran or a uh, country like Iran because they live in fr freedom and um, they can worship God without uh, the fear of being um, arre arrested too hard. Um, however, uh, these days, uh, because of the influence of the media, um, social media, uh, it's, it's easier to uh, know and to be aware of the uh, condition of the people who live under persecution. And for the same reason, people in the West are becoming more aware and they uh, are getting more involved in helping their brothers and sisters which I know is very encouraging to uh, people in Iran. Um, I do not think Iranians think that they abounded, uh, feel Iranians they feel don't. abounded mm -hmm. or uh, on care by other Christians in the West. Mm -hmm. Because as you might know, uh, there were uh, some Christian prisoners who uh, had been released as a result of um, Christian support in the West. Mm -hmm. However, they might think that People who live in free uh, countries do not really appreciate that, appreciate their freedom and take it for granted. Mm -hmm. 
Um, also, I believe the persecution that um, is happening in my country, Iran, uh, and in the part of other world, um, is generally is bringing more people to Christ. Mm. Uh, God is using the persecution to show uh, how people um, show uh, people how much they need Jesus as their savior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how do you think, Nasteran, that women like us in this room and those who are watching the live stream, how can we really be supportive beyond a hashtag, which is significant, <laughs> but sometimes can be empty? Are there some ways we can generally support, help uh, Christian believers under persecution? Um, sure, uh, you can keep praying um, for them. Uh, I know uh, that there were people who pray um, for me while I was going to, through that difficult time. And um, it, it's really encouraging uh, when, when you're on persecution, it's very encouraging to know that your brothers and sister uh, standing with you by um, their supports, pray, uh, prayers, and also keeping your situation in the news. Uh, the government, like Iran, are scared of losing their face and um, of the negative publicly um, against them. So spreading the news um, of Christians who are under persecution uh, can be a huge help. And hopefully it will make government to release them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many ways we can help our brothers and sisters, uh, such as writing a letter to them or t uh, talking to the government officially, helping their family or uh, helping their family uh, who are outside the prison. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put up on the screen a list of some organizations where you can get information about people under persecution. These are organizations that serve some of the needs of the persecuted church because you said they're write a letter to them. And I, my first thought is, well, how would I know how to do that? Right. And so um, I would appreciate it if... Um, some of you would talk about some of these organizations. Maybe we can just, would you start, Dr. Carson, perhaps? Just if someone can, said to you, I want some information about uh, persecuted people or, organ, or I have some money that I want to provide to organizations that help persecute the persecuted, what would you recommend and what would you tell them about that organization? Well, the first thing I would do is ask what part of the world they're particularly interested in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because many of these organizations are, uh, the, most of our discussion is focused on the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. But in, in some ways, that's, that, that's a narrow focus. That's right. Huh. Um, things are tightening up again in China, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Or think what Christians face in North Korea that's right. and so on. So the first thing I would want to do is ask what part of the world are you particularly interested okay. in. And then within that framework, it's pretty easy to track down uh, organizations. And, and it's some, of, some of them, where they work within the country, I don't want to mention their names publicly. Okay. Uh, be because they're trying to keep low profile. That's right. mm -hmm. And then there are much larger organizations like Samaritan's Purse and organizations like that, where they have contacts and mm -hmm. tentacles that you can uh, follow out to get in, in touch with people in certain parts of the world. Mm. Um, in, in terms of sort of a broad survey of what's going on, there are a lot of organizations like that. Uh, some websites, uh, in terms of uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, newsprint, one of the best monthly summaries that I know for what's going on in, in the world is Evangelicals Now, a British publication, which uh, highlights something like uh, 80 or 90 a month. And that's, that's both in print and digital. But, but there are many, many organizations that try to bring you up to date uh, yeah. uh, in websites and, um, and uh, uh, other yeah. resources. Mm -hmm. Karen, what would you recommend to those? Well, I'd say that's, that, that's really good, like thinking about region and where, where you, know, you feel that God is um, directing your heart geographically, but also to understand that among organizations, there are people specializing in different types of support. Um, for example, some people do uh, humanitarian relief. Some people do, um, uh, some people limit their funds just to Christians. Others uh, broadly distribute their funds to people who are, need humanitarian relief of all faiths. 
Um, my organization, International Christian Response, our focus is on church planters in hostile regions. And we're there whether they're in crisis or not. You know, we do everything from church planting training to um, discipleship training to supporting them with legal aid. So you just have to kind of take a look at, uh, just understand that it's not just a blanket umbrella. We're helping the persecuted church. Mm -hmm. But each organization actually has a focus and functions like the body does, kind of filling in different holes according to what the needs are. Thank you, Karen. Mindy, what would you add? Yeah, and I want to third the the admonition that it's possible to be educated and that we should we should be educated I think before we give and and all that's been said before um, I'm really struck that these are headline stories right now the New York Times did a wonderful story uh, a week or so ago about what's happening in China yeah. and the cross is coming down and the churches being under some renewed persecution there and it's possible by reading those accounts to see the groups they're quoted that are working there at World, on our website, we keep a list because we have focused so much about what's ha on what's happening in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, we keep a list, uh, it, it's under a button called Aid for Iraqis. Many of those groups are working throughout the Middle East, not simply in Iraq, but that's how we've organized the list. And those are, and it's listed in such a way that you can click on the names and go to the websites and you can see pictures of how these groups are working. I want to mention the significance of supporting some of these groups that are working in these very, very difficult situations. We've watched over the last week and a half the Iraq army moving into this area, Fallujah. Fallujah is mostly a Muslim uh, territory and has been kind of a nest for ISIS. The first aid group to come in and able to penetrate all of the levels of both security and danger and to deliver aid to really starving families was Preemptive Love Coalition, a group that is run by a Christian named Jeremy Courtney who lives in Iraq with his, with his family. That is just one of many organizations, Samaritan's Purse, Servant Group International, a number that I encounter who have people dedicated on the ground making the kinds of relationships that are necessary to do this kind of thing. Jeremy described to me I mean, he listed off probably 20 people he had to get permission mm -hmm. from in order to take this one truck of aid in. But it's significant that dedicated Christians are doing mm -hmm. this kind of work. I love Servant Group International. Uh, a number of them are at my church, and mm -hmm. they're taking groups of people over to Greece yes. that they're there on the shore as refugees come on, and they give them dry socks. And, and I love their boldness. They yeah. say, you've heard that Iraq is dangerous go anyway. Let's go anyway. Yeah. I know, don't you yeah. love that? Well, in the ultimate act of persecution, Christ was nailed on a cross. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Dr. Carson, while that was the greatest evil of all time, it also accomplished the greatest good of all time. Mm -hmm. So how does that uh, impact our perspective about persecution? Are there good things that you have seen come from persecution? Just anyone who has something, feel free to answer. The slogan that a lot of people cite is the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I think that that's only sometimes true. It's, mm -hmm. it's really important to say that sometimes the blood of the martyrs is just the blood of the martyrs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, historically, um, uh, the, the, blood, the blood of the markers tends to lead towards church growth when there's pressure and then backing off, then pressure and then backing off, then pressure and then backing off. So that the, the, the pressure tends to purify the church. There's not a lot of nominalism when you've got a persecution. And then when it backs off, the in intensity and gratitude before God of these people tends to foster boldness and witness and so on. So it's not always the case, but that's, that's pretty commonly p part of the pattern of multiplied church growth in Ethiopia under Haile Selassie or in, 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 in China in the last uh, 70 years and so on. But sometimes, as in Albania, for example, the blood of the martyrs just meant the crushing of the church. Mm -hmm. By the time they were finished, there was no church there. Right. Mm -hmm. And you start all over again. Mm -hmm. and, and you remember how strong the church was in Western Turkey mm -hmm. uh, in the second century, the third century, the fourth century. Um, it was eventually utterly crushed mm -hmm. so that there was no uh, Christian witness whatsoever. As recently as 1972, 73, there were only 
35, 37 known evangelicals in all of Turkey. Um, and uh, half of them were converted in, in, uh, in, in Cambridge, England, uh, as, uh, as external students. Uh, today, there may be five or 6,000 cr uh, evangelical Christians in, in, in all of Turkey. So, so w one doesn't want to become dreamy-eyed about, about uh, persecution. Mm -hmm. Yet, you still have to say, Christ declares, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And one way or the other, um, there, there is glory that emerges even in the tears and the anguish. And, and you don't make that glory uh, comfortable any more than you want to make the glory of the cross comfortable. It, it, it still is a barbaric instrument of torture, and the glory comes uh, uh, out of it anyway to the, to the praise of God and the good of his people. Um, but, but while you say that, that mustn't be said with a romantic uh, uh, overtone. Um, it's, it's, it's in the, the pain and the agony and the, 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 the torture that still he who sits in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And, and, and meanwhile, he comes along and wipes away every tear and, and promises, uh, you haven't seen anything of the comfort that I'm going to give yet. The day is coming when there will be no more sorrow and no more pain and no more tear and no more evil. Yeah. Yeah. And so we join the church in every generation and cry, yes, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, yeah. Will you thank our panel? <laughs> the writer to the Hebrews who were beginning to face significant persecution, he wrote this, and it's a good word to us, too. He said... For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And then he quotes from Habakkuk, yet a little while, the time and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And he says, but we are not of those who shrink back. <laughs> Don't you want that to be said of you? We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So will you sing with me? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Lord, make us women who are bold. Give us the endurance that we need that as people who in the workplace and on the soccer sidelines and in our neighborhoods as we may begin to be ostracized, criticized, uh, misunderstood, would you give us the endurance and the boldness we need that we will not shrink back? Amen. Thank you. <laughs>